All right, can I um, um, uh, get us all to, um, to assemble? Thank you all for uh, coming and uh, joining us uh, this evening. We, um, this is uh, for our, any new students who we have, since uh, we're just um, welcome some new students in January. This is our um, monthly public health forum where we invite a um, leading scholar to talk about their area um, within a, a theme. And uh, the theme that uh, we have been um, pursuing this year really is trying to understand the big challenges in uh, population health. And our speakers have been addressing that from their perspective. We are uh, extraordinarily lucky to have with us today Alain Baudet, who is, as, uh, you can see there, the president of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Just to ground it for our American audience, is the equivalent of the Canadian NIH. Um, Alain has been uh, with CIHR since 2008. Um, before that, he was president and chief executive officer of the equivalent or agency in uh, Quebec. What's interesting about uh, Professor Baudet is that uh, he has had a uh, career on both sides of the funding equation, and that he is a uh, world-renowned um, uh, neurologist. He was at the uh, Montreal Neurological Institute, and um, he uh, was the associate director of that institute from 85 to 92, and uh, has been involved in uh, multiple uh, departments at McGill University, has uh, written uh, papers in all the right journals, uh, book chapters in all the right books, and received grants from all the most prestigious uh, funding organizations. And then he, um, as he put it himself, went over to the dark side. But um, Nobody's perfect. Um, um, he, uh, Professor Baudet, has received a lot of um, distinction, in, uh, starting from when he was a postdoctoral fellow, um, including the Murray Barr Junior Scientist Award. In 2004, he was awarded the Prix Adrien Poilot of the Associ Association Francophone pour le Savoir. He, and he's also, in 2011, became a knight of the National Order of Quebec, which is the highest order awarded by the government in Quebec, which means he has the distinction of being the first knight to present in our public health forum. <laughs> Um, uh, but uh, we, we aim to string together a, a, a list of long list of nights, but uh, it's, uh, you, you will always be the first. <laughs> um, uh, he uh, trained at the uh, Université de Montréal and the uh, Centre d'Etudes Nucléaires in uh, France and uh, in uh, University of Zurich's Brain Research Institute. Um, I think uh, Professor Baudet brings a really uh, unique uh, perspective to uh, how we should be advancing um, public health science for global health, and uh, we are truly uh, thrilled to have him. Alan. Thank you, Sandra. I, I'm, I'm not the second night after the night of Malta. I have not been so nice. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for, for the invitation and the privilege. And, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the ones, all those of you who have had the pleasure and, and, and privilege of meeting today and discussing with. And uh, I know that you know when these uh, foreigners come and you have to spend an hour with them, it, it can be a bit tedious, and, but it was, you know, I learned a lot and, and, and it was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, it, it was for me, uh, brought, brought back a lot of memories today. Uh, the memories of, of my previous life where I would actually go and, uh, as you all do, and give seminars and, uh, and then uh, meet with faculty and, and have scientific <laughs> discussions. Except that I, I, feed, you know, I feel a bit like a fraud here in the sense that I, I actually uh, will be talking about uh, population and public health and global health. Uh, two areas, as you as you heard, uh, that I'm actually not uh, a specialist in, but uh, two areas where uh, I um, I have come to realize uh, the importance uh, of investing in as as a research funder, and I thought that uh, it would be a terrific opportunity uh, to be able to to talk about Canada, uh, the structure of our. Uh, research system of our healthcare system, uh, how public health is supported, and uh, and to look at our priorities in, in public health research, since this is the theme of the of the series, but but also uh, how it fits with uh, more globally uh, the the priorities in health and priorities of of health agencies around the world uh, in, in research, and and I think and I hope that you will find this interesting. So I've slightly modified the title because I, I realized that the global health is really coming late in the talk. So uh, I, uh, I, I call it from public health to global health. 
uh, a health research funder's approach to sustainable development. And, and, and let me first uh, talk a bit about the Canadian Institutes of, of uh, Health Research, which is, uh, as you heard, Canada's agency responsible for funding health research. Now, this agency was, is, is, we're very young, actually. We celebrated our 15th anniversary uh, this year. Uh, we were created in 2000, and we, we were created on a foundation, however, which was the Medical Research Council of Canada, but uh, with two big differences. One is that our mandate became considerably broader than that of the Medical Research Council, which very much like the UK uh, was more a uh, mandate focused on biomedical research and to some extent clinical research, but did not encompass uh, social determinants of health, uh, health services and policy research, and population and public health, and certainly not global health. So that's a, a, a huge uh, increase in, in the mandate. But also, uh, more fundamentally, and as you can read in, in the green frame uh, on, on this slide, uh, the mandate, uh, as described in the Act, which uh, uh, created CIHR, uh, implies not only the creation of new knowledge, which you know, funding agencies tra you know, traditionally are pretty good at, but also the translation of this knowledge into improved health for Canadians, more effective health services and products in a strengthened Canadian healthcare system, which is a, a dual challenge. A, it is a challenge for a health research organization to ensure translation and impact on, on these elements, but also uh, it, a particular challenge in Canada because we're talking about uh, constitutional jurisdictions here. Uh, research uh, a, being a, fed, a federal jurisdiction, whereas Healthcare is a provincial and territorial jurisdiction. So, if you really have to, uh, if you really have to ensure impact on health services, on health care, you really need to work in a very collaborative fashion with the provinces. And and that has been one of the, the most challenging, but also uh, one of the most exciting aspects uh, on my job. We're supporting approximately. Uh, 13,700 uh, researchers and trainees uh, at, the, at the present time based mainly, uh, well, all in the academic world, mainly universities and, and university hospitals and, and research centers. Uh, we fund both uh, initiated, the research initiated by investigators themselves, best ideas, best mind, that's about 70% of our one billion plus uh, million dollar, uh, billion dollars budget, but we also have part of our budget, uh, thirty percent, uh, that is devoted to strategic investments in in areas where we feel that there are gaps, uh, that uh, there 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 are particular needs for the country. Uh, there are emerging threats for the country, or where we uh, need or uh, want to build capacity. So uh, we are uh, trying to foster, uh, as best as possible, uh, innovation, commercialization, translation of research results into the healthcare system, and uh, I'll talk a bit about this later. Now, uh, the, the org chart, uh, I'll be fast. The, the, the only interesting thing here that I wanted to see is that we actually report, uh, we report to uh, the, uh, what do I have a, no, sorry. So uh, I, we, we report to the Minister of Health, and we're the green, the green box there to, to your left. Uh, and the interesting aspect of it is when it comes to interacting with the regulatory agency, which is Health Canada, or interacting in, uh, in public health matters with the Public Health Agency of Canada, we're very well poised because we're in the same portfolio, we report to the same ministry, and there's therefore a, a, a capacity for us to act in a synergistic way uh, as much as possible within a big federal bureaucracy. But, you know, on some, on some I must say that on, on some topics, we've been uh, very successful at, at working the three of us together. Uh, if I think about our response to H1N, one, our response to SARS, uh, our response more recently to Ebola, uh, or uh, our, the development of the vaccine enterprise in Canada. These are all areas where we've collaborated pretty closely. 
uh, particularly with the Public Health Agency of Canada. The other thing that's really sort of interesting is that all the rest of, of the science support enterprise in Canada reports to another ministry. Uh, the Minister of Science, uh, herself a junior minister under the Minister of Innovation, uh, Science, and uh, Economic Development. So that's on the right side. And there you have another uh, number of uh, sister agencies, the one, the INSERC, that supports uh, natural sciences and engineering, SHRC, supporting social sciences uh, and humanities, and, and two uh, other organizations a little more at arm's length, the Canada Foundation, uh, Canada Innovation, sorry, uh, CFI Canada Foundation for Innovation and uh, the uh, and Genome Canada that uh, are funding in uh, all areas of research. But in the case of Genome Canada, uh, largely in health, I would say up to 70%. And in the case of the Canada Foundation for Innovation, funding equipment in our universities and centers where we provide uh, or support to researchers with operating funds. Uh, we also uh, have in our mission the mandate to advise the Minister of Health on matters relating particularly to health research, but at times also to health policy, which a little more often on health policy, but, you know, certainly on, on matters uh, relating to health research, uh, the, the, the Minister uh, really relies on us. And at the same time, uh, while uh, being within our mandate to support the federal government policy directions, and the minister's priority, we are at arm's length of the minister. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a schizogenic position at times where on the one hand I report to the minister of health, but at the same time the minister of health cannot tell me to fund this or that grant because the mechanism is absolutely uh, firewalled and there's a peer review system which ensures that, in fact, as I tell the minister, for your own protection minister, it's much better if you, you know, let the peer review system decides uh, who and what is funded, uh, otherwise you get into a slippery slope. But obviously when uh, the Ministry of Health tells me that she would like uh, CHR to pay attention to the growing issue antimicrobial resistance together with the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada, it, obviously uh, we, we will do so, but again, always through a competitive process. So there's never direct funding of an individual or an institution for that matter that would go through CHR. When it comes to CHR, it, it, always, uh, it, it always comes through a competitive process. So as I said, we have a very broad mandate that uh, encompasses the, what we like to call the four pillars, biomedical, clinical, health services and policy research, and population, public health, and global health. Now, uh, there's, there, there's, a, um, there's a, a, a big space between these uh, four elements, which, which actually uh, does not exist, because we're obviously talking here about a continuum that goes, uh, in an, 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 and I would say more a circle, where uh, obviously biomedical uh, questions uh, are uh, fed uh, by health issues and, and questions from coming from the clinical side. Uh, are translated into clinical uh, trials, and and then uh, the uh, you know the, the the results are then successfully or not implemented into the healthcare system, and uh, affect the whole of the population. If we look at the progress of funding uh, over the years, uh, as you can see, uh, well, you can see a number of things. First of all, you can see that all pillars have seen an increase uh, of their budget over the years, but you can also see that uh, from the, uh, the, the 2008, which is the uh, uh, economic downside, uh, and since we've, we've really uh, flatted off, and, and we're very encouraged by uh, what we're hearing from the new government, uh, that now is the time to reinvest in science. So we're all awaiting anxiously uh, the, the coming budget. And, and I've been, uh, uh, as you may uh, imagine, very uh, fast at pointing out to the minister that the NIH has just had a $2 billion increase in its budget and that it was a very good example to follow, in my opinion. <laughs> that would triple our budget. That would be bad, right? <laughs> Uh, but there are other things that are quite interesting, and 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 then that shows you the the importance actually of having this this strategic uh, and 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 you'll see it in a minute, the strategic funding. 
Uh, the biomedical, because of DMRC, is, is a sector that has been established in Canada for, for many, many years. And, and not surprisingly, uh, as you can see in dark blue here, uh, first of all, their budget didn't increase as much because they had already grown their capacity, but also most of the money that's going to the biomedical field is actually obtained through the investigator-initiated program. And very little, actually, is, is obtained through the strategic investments. Why? because we did use uh, our strategic investments, particularly to invest into areas which we felt were underdeveloped, understaffed, uh, and, and where there were huge gaps, which were the uh, population in public health and the uh, health systems uh, research. And you can see that the increase there has been more massive, but you can see that when you look at the investment in both of these cases, you're looking at a 50-50 investment between the strategic targeted and uh, the bottom up, uh, which, is, uh, which is the dark one. So very difficult, very different. So the question is, uh, does it work? And before we, we come to that, uh, I just want to uh, mention something that I, I, I forgot to mention, is that we, we, may, we, we are one organization, but an organization with 13 parts which we call the puzzle, because their parts are interdigitated and interrelated. Uh, these are the 13 institutes, hence the name Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Now, these institutes are very different from the NIH institutes. From one thing, we do not fund intramural research in Canada. The intramural research is funded by another organization, which is the National Research Council. We fund strictly extramural, extramural research. Second, these institutes are virtual institutes. They don't have walls, and they are really run by top scientists in the field that work 50% of their time for CIHR as scientific directors. They're really team leaders. They're really uh, investigators where, you know, and their institute is actually physically based where their research activities are based. And so that varies with time and with the turnover of scientific directors. So we have institute based in Vancouver, in Calgary, in uh, Winnipeg, in Toronto, uh, in London, in Montreal, in Quebec City, uh, one in Ottawa as well. Uh, and it's quite, it, it's a bit like, you know, it's, it's a bit like the Foreign Service. So they, they get to come to, to Ottawa as members of Science Council, and they come once, uh, once a month, and, and as such, are uh, called upon to uh, not only speak uh, in the name of their institute, but also more broadly, uh, to collectively decide on the strategic investments of the organization. And they vote on all the scientific uh, decisions that are made by the organization. So that's delegated authority from uh, our, uh, our board, the governing council. But in addition to that, of course, they are meant to mobilize their communities. Uh, to partner and, and to develop partnerships, particularly with the NGOs, but also in some cases, when, when appropriate, with the private sector, and to uh, ensure that they develop research in their field. So at times conflicting, because uh, on the one hand, they, 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 they're really pressing for their field and the development of their area. That's their mandate. But at the same time, when they come to Canada, to Ottawa, at, as members of, of Science Council, they have to think more broadly about what's important uh, uh, for the entire community and what's important for the country as a whole in terms of research needs, and think in terms of pillars. And that's where it gets a little more complicated, because one of the institutes is actually an institute of population of public health. So population of public health is represented twice in the organization. As a pillar, every institute has a mandate to support publication in public health. And when you, you notice I said support, not fund, because the actual budget of the institute is not that large. It does, however, collectively, there are 13 of them, constitute uh, a big chunk, approximately half of our strategic budget. So together, this being said, it means only 15% of the total budget. Their influence is way more strategic, is way more one of being the lead of the area and, and of the, the network of researchers in that area in, in the country. And interacting with the other institute directors to ensure harmonious uh, 
functioning of the organization. But when it comes to population of public health, when CITRA was created, because it's an area together with uh, health policy uh, and, and health services research that was felt to be under supported, we created two institutes for these in addition to there being uh, pillars. So um, the, the, the Institute of public, the, of public Health is particularly interesting because it was created at a time uh, the, the, when the, the, um, the, the public health uh, infrastructures in Canada were not well developed. And, and since then, we've seen major changes to, to the context. First of all, we've seen an expansion of the graduate education programs. We've seen the um, establishment of the Public Health Agency of Canada, with, which did not exist. This agency was created after the SARS crisis to ensure that should something else happen uh, in, in, the, in that realm in the future, and it did actually with H1N1, uh, we, we would have a capacity to respond. Uh, a number of provinces created also their public health agency. Ontario uh, and Quebec and BC each have their own um, uh, agency. And, and finally, and that's very interesting, several major charities who are entirely focused on, on the biomedical issues started to uh, look into funding uh, population and public health research. And, and that really has made a difference because it's, it's brought, of course, other new sources of support for the research. So the mandate of the Institute of Population and Public Health is to support research into the biological, social, cultural, and environmental interactions that determine the health of individual communities and global populations, so pretty, pretty broad. And again, always a translational element to apply this knowledge to improve the health of individuals and populations through strategic partnerships with population and public health stakeholders and innovative research funding programs. The vision of the Institute is to be a scientific leader for CIHR, the research community that catalyzes excellent research to examine the interactions among determinants of health and the impact of public health strategies and intersectoral policies on equitable population health improvements in Canada and globally tall order, but it's important because this mission has really been that of the entire population uh, and public health mandate area at CIHR, which is not negible. If you look at the progression in green of the number of researchers that are carrying research in the population and public health mandate area, you see that A, it's been increasing considerably since the creation of the organization, and B, that it accounts for uh, a quarter, roughly, of the investigators we're funding right now. So uh, it, is, it, it is a very sizable number of individuals involved in population and public health that were funded at CIHR. Now what's interesting is I told you about the strategic investments uh, here illustrated in uh, green that are made through uh, priority-driven grants, uh, either broadly uh, multi-institute priority strategic uh, initiatives or uh, initiatives of the institute proper. And what you can see is the impact, first of all, the increase, as we saw, in the strategic investments, but more importantly, the impact it had in creating capacity and how these researchers were then able to compete successfully in the open grants competition, and that's the line in purple, where we've seen a considerable increase in investigator-initiated successful granting. And, and that, to us, is, is really reassuring, and, and the two lines below, same thing for the students in the ORDs, that when you invest strategically in an area, if, if you invest in, in, a, in a fashion that's strategic, and if you build capacity, you will see with time a difference uh, in, in the capacity to compete uh, in, in the, the global open competitions at CIHR with actually uh, impact of research, which is not negligible, always difficult in that field to find uh, appropriate keywords because it seems like it's not uh, always the, the, the way we consider things, not necessarily uh, the way Mr. Garfield considers things. But this being said, as you can see, Canada in red, although, as you can see from the size of the, the, size of the circle, the, you know, by comparison with the United States, our uh, productivity uh, and, and impact and specialization index, so the highest uh, the impact and uh, the more to the right, uh, the, the highest specialization index in that area. We're very close to 
the United States. We actually uh, are ranking uh, quite, um, well, I, I think we're, you know, we're sixth position uh, in the world in, in terms of impact of publication in, in this field, which is uh, pretty reassuring. Uh, and uh, we also uh, seem to be having uh, an impact on the stakeholders. So what you're looking at in, in yellow and, and gray are uh, the people that actually uh, report an impact. So in, in dark yellow, it's to great extent, and pale yellow to some extent, in gray, a little extent. And uh, what's interesting is that the impact seems to be the greatest among uh, health system practitioners and consumers of health system. Uh, a little less uh, among the uh, managers, uh, unfortunately, and, uh, and, and much less uh, among the health systems professional organizations. And, and that's something we know now we have to, uh, to work on. Now, this may be all very nice and, uh, and, and, and you know, we're claimed to have impact, but when we look at the Canadian healthcare system that we're so proud of, in fact, it's said at times that Canadians identified to their country through two things, hockey and their healthcare system. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that they're, well, I, I think they're doing the, this, the, the they're, in both cases, I'm, I'm not sure they're doing exactly the, the, the right thing, because thanks to the US, we're not in the last position, uh, <laughs> but, but we're not far. And, uh, and as you can see, we, we, we rank seventh for quality of care, sixth for efficiency, fifth for access, and, and fifth for equity, according to the, uh, the Commonwealth uh, 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 review system. And of course, some will say that, yeah, but that's not, you know, that's not a good system, and you can't believe in their ranking. It's like the university rankings. You know, in every university that, that is not ranked properly says that the system is bad. But this being said, it's, it's, it's the only one that we can rely upon. And you know, I can tell you uh, from anecdotal evidence, they're probably not very far from the truth. Um, and, and in some cases, we're doing pathetically. And, and that, you know, that's more serious. Uh, we, we tend to forget uh, that in Canada, and something I've discussed with some of you this afternoon earlier, uh, our indigenous communities uh, are doing particularly badly uh, when it comes to, uh, to anything going from infant mortality to uh, life expectancy. Uh, you know, we're way below, the, the Aboriginal is way below Canadian average. Uh, and mortality and morbidity rates are, are, are morbidity rates are, are above, and as you can see, uh, in, it is particularly uh, striking in Nunavut in the north, the, the, the upper graph on the right, uh, where the Inuit population is, is faring extraordinarily poorly uh, when it comes to infant mortality and, and dramatically when it comes to suicide rate and um, you know, broadly mental health issue, uh, addiction uh, issues, but, but also uh, tuberculosis, uh, oral health problems. Uh, and, and in the case of suicide, the highest, uh, 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 really the highest incidence in the world uh, of suicide in, in, the, in young males. And it has been uh, now uh, called a, 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 an emergency uh, priority issue in, uh, in, in Nunavut. So uh, we have to, and, and, and we are trying to, and we'll see that in a minute, ramp up our investments uh, in research in, in those areas. Now, obviously, uh, we're not care providers, and uh, obviously we're facing with particularly uh, difficult accessibility to care. We're talking about small communities, very isolated communities, over huge territories and extraordinarily uh, precarious living conditions and, and, and very, very poor socioeconomic context. But this being said, uh, there's a lot of research evidence that is needed. And uh, a lot of the interventions that actually brought to these people are never properly evaluated. And if they were properly evaluated, we would know whether they're successful or not, which we never happen to actually get real information of. And if they were successful, we could scale them up, which we never managed to do, which, you know, uh, made Canada uh, the, um, the, the, the champion of pilot projects. <laughs> now, we're also collectively uh, facing uh, increased uh, global challenges, and nothing here that you're not familiar with, but just to tell you that feel good, we're hit by them too. Uh, the increase in non-communicable diseases worldwide. 
uh, the emergence of, of new and re-emergence of old uh, infectious disease. And it seems like uh, there's one a year these days. I mean, we saw it was Ebola last year. It's, Tika, it's, it's, it's Zika this year. Uh, HIV AIDS, which uh, we, we like to think uh, uh, is, is, is a past uh, emergency, but you know better than I that there's still 35 million people who live with HIV today and that it's become a chronic disease. And finally, an emerging threat, which is antimicrobial resistance. And, uh, and we're working very closely with the European Union and the United States to tackle this issue uh, within our means. But it's something that has been on our radar screen for a long time. Uh, we've been collaborating first with uh, the uh, UK and, and more recently quite uh, extensively with the European Union on, on this topic and, and are now, now broadening the, we have just had a new budgetary Envelope from government to broaden our research investments in that area. So, you know, it, it's not surprising, therefore, then, when you look at the top health research priorities uh, for uh, in, in the world, the, the, the global trend, trends, and I've put little uh, flags on top to see whether the U.S. were there, and as you see, the U.S., Canada, these are the ones where Canada is, of course, and, but you see that the U.S. Is, is there on many of them. So, you know, starting from the left, uh, emerging threats, and particularly uh, emerging infectious diseases. So uh, we mentioned that. Uh, big data is the second one. Harmonization and access to data, seen as a major uh, international health priority, which, which is interesting and, and would not have been one that I, that I would have put so high in the list. Health inequity, uh, right your ballpark, guys. Uh, it's the third one. Uh, health system efficiency is the fourth one. Global health is the fifth one. Mental health and interventions in mental health is the sixth one. E-health initiatives, not surprisingly, a little far. I would have thought that this would have been a, uh, a higher one. Environment and health, child and maternal health, and personalized medicine. So this great personalized medicine that we're all talking about and, and so investing in Actually, when you look at you know, the global trends in the country's health priorities, it's, it's quite, quite, uh, quite way down the list. Now, uh, we did the same exercise looking at what the priorities of the health research funding agency were, uh, as it were, and, uh, and you can see that it's very similar, but, but not totally the same. So in terms of, of importance, as you know, we brought that back into percentage, uh, the first one is chronic diseases, uh, followed by mental health, which is a chronic disease, so you could just add that on. Access to care, not surprisingly. There we're really at the same place as the health priorities. Child and maternal health, which was also one of the top priorities uh, in terms of health. Electronic health records. Aging, which did not appear curiously uh, on uh, the uh, trends. It's there, but I mean, I gave you just the, you know, the top ones. It, it, it's fairly low, and yet uh, clearly a huge problem for the G7 countries, and, and something that Japan, uh, who is chairing the G7 uh, country, has put uh, on, on top of the, of the health agenda. Healthcare uh, efficiency, environment and health again. And again, personalized medicine. Uh, lower down together with patient-oriented research uh, and care. So uh, now CHR's priorities. So basically, if, if you look at our strategic plan, and I promise I won't go through the strategic plan, but, but they're really, a strategic plan is, is like our budgetary envelope. On the one hand, you know, it's let's fund the best and the brightest and the greatest ideas, and a lot of focus on funding uh, investigator-initiated research and funding it better. And by that, I mean defining and supporting excellence in all areas of our mandate. Very, and too often, I would say, we've defined excellence like a, you know, against the criteria either used by universities for promotion, you know, a tad old-fashioned, if you want my opinion, uh, or uh, according to standards of excellence that were really established by and for the biomedical system. So how do we define excellence as it applies for all these sectors 
that, that, we, that we looked at. And, and of course, this can only be done through changing the peer review system to ensure that there's a true input of all the appropriate players and in some cases, stakeholders, and in some cases, depending on the type of research, research users to define that this is excellence, both in terms of scientific purity, but also scientific relevance. And then their uh, second part of our strategic plan is our in our strategic investments, in our research priorities. Because it's not a hard to have research priorities for an open competition where you, know, you fund the best and the brightest. But when it's strategic, then you can really, as you saw, you can really exert an effect. And there we've got four priorities. And you'll see that they, they're all you know, from, they, they were all in, 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 that, uh, in that priority list. Health innovation for enhanced patient experience and outcome. Health equity for Aboriginal peoples in Canada a healthier future through preventative action, so more focus on prevention, and improved quality of life for the persons living with chronic conditions. Because yes, we can prevent to some extent. Yes, we can cure to some extent. But in some cases, we have to maintain and maintain properly. And, and we feel that there's a lot of research needed in that area. So to go a little more into weeds, we're talking uh, for priority, the first priority about focus with the provinces on implementation science in the point of care to ensure uh, evidence-based practice, increase evidence-based practice, and ensure responsiveness to, decision, to, to the questions of the patients, the priorities, the preoccupation of the, pre, the, of the patients on the one hand, and, and the questions and needs of the healthcare providers, particularly the ministries of health, on the other hand. How can we actually provide you the evidence that will allow you to make evidence-based policy decisions and will allow you to scale up interventions that are successful into the system? They have the means to do it. We have a purely, totally universal uh, healthcare system. In, in case of uh, Aboriginal people, a focus on tuberculosis, tobacco use, and food safety. Uh, in case of the third priority, climate change, antimicrobial resistant, environments and health. And finally, in the third priority, uh, dementia and, and global health. Also a focus on new ways of doing things and, and certain methodological approaches, implementation research, reciprocal learning, and scalability of sustainability of interventions, which is really critical, we feel, in that area. If we want to address the, the complexity of, of, of both, you know, both locally and globally of the health challenges we're, we're, we're facing. So what works for whom and under what contextual circumstances? So uh, a few of the major strategic initiatives that we're funding in, in the area of population of public health, from primary health care to changing lifestyles, Aboriginal people's health, climate change, environment and health, tobacco control, full and uh, water safety. We've got strategic investments in all of these areas. Just a few examples. In primary health care, uh, we're lagging behind badly, and in collaboration with the provincial government, it wouldn't make any sense to do it uh, otherwise, and they've been investing actually massively with us in that. Uh, A, creating teams uh, that will uh, develop innovative approaches to improving the delivery of appropriate and high-quality community-based primary health care in Canada. And we need a lot of evidence there because the system is absolutely not working well. But at the same time, ensuring that the provinces don't develop each their little siloed approach. So developing a network to ensure that all these teams actually communicate, share best practices, and uh, work together to uh, support a better uh, evidence-informed transformation of our primary health care system. Aboriginal people health, many initiatives there. I won't go through all of them. The major one is, is a $30 million uh, initiative on, uh, in implementation science 
uh, in uh, Aboriginal communities, both first, you know, including First Nations, Métis, and Inuit populations in the north. Uh, the goal is to create better preventive health services, healthier communities, and health equity for First Nations. And uh, that in four priority areas, suicide prevention, diabetes, obesity, tuberculosis, oral health. There we're working with Indian Affairs Canada to ensure that uh, eventually uh, when we have the evidence of successful interventions, uh, they will be there behind us to uh, scale up interventions and, and implement them, something that obviously is neither our mandate uh, nor our role. Uh, addressing health-related consequences of environmental change, we've invested in the past mainly uh, in, on the health impact of associated changes in both natural and built environments. Uh, major investments uh, on genes and chronic disease relate as they pertain to the environment uh, and also health outcomes associated with resource development, agriculture, and industry. Now, we've just launched a major strategic initiative on environments and health uh, of, again, approximately 30 million over five years to support further research uh, in that field on those themes, but, but also others that, that will come hopefully from the base. Tobacco control, like in many areas, you know, uh, Canada can do it alone. We, we're small, uh, we have uh, a relatively small workforce and uh, a population that's uh, a tenth of the population of the U.S., if, if you know, if not even, actually. So we do it through collaboration, as you can see, largely uh, through collaboration with the U.S. So you can see Canada, the little flag there. The, the, wide, uh, the, the wide bar shows that we're linked mainly to the U.S. And, and to the U.K. in terms of collaborative approaches. But as you can see, uh, the U.S. also is, is a terrific collaborator in the area of tobacco control and, and collaborates uh, with uh, a number of countries, uh, so, so is the U.K. So with the U.S., uh, and we, we are actually uh, we, uh, on one of the leading cooperating countries in that area. One example, uh, you know, the major grant that we've ever funded, uh, up to recently, actually, we've funded a large one now, but a $7 million grant, which is, you know, pretty pretty large, uh, to uh, Dr. Jeffrey Fung to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of tobacco control policies of World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. A huge uh, research endeavor, a collaboration with uh, 100 plus researchers across 23 uh, countries. Health in the age of climate change, uh, as you know, uh, climate change uh, between now and 2050 is expected to cause uh, approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year due to malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and, and heat stress. Uh, we've been very modest in that area, and obviously the flattening our funds, uh, you know, has, has had an, an effect of what we would like to do versus what we actually did. And this is an area where we've, you know, our investments are, are, are really flattened out and, and where we intend to uh, increase investing in, in the future years. And, and with the very uh, high uh, importance that this government is giving to uh, climate change, and uh, A, recognizing climate change, and, and B, uh, actually uh, fighting it, uh, we, we feel that now is the time to come to, to reinvest in that area. Nonetheless, we, we are a member of the International Research Initiative on Adaptation to Climate Change, or ARIAC. And uh, we, uh, this is, as you may be aware of, a project that examines the impacts of weather events and long-term climate variability on human health. And, and we're also, um, we have also just launched a research initiative on food security and climate change in the North. The North, as you're probably aware, is extremely sensitive to climate change, as being the most affected. And actually, there are entire regions that were a lake region that is now a desert, just to give you an example. That affects the population 
population in a big way through a number of ways, uh, and, and sometimes totally unpredictable, you know, increase in accidental death because the ice is not as solid as it used to be and they just, you know, drown on their skidoos. Uh, the, uh, the caribous have totally changed their migration pattern, a major food staple for the Inuit. So this is totally changing uh, and, and affecting the, the health of the population. You know, no longer caribous, uh, you eat McDonald's and, uh, and you become obese. Uh, safe food and water initiative. Uh, so this is, uh, and I mentioned that again, one uh, a major strategic initiative that, uh, that, that we've supported. And, and we've supported one recently, uh, again, for, for northern communities where uh, it's, it's become a, a, an issue between contaminated seafood and absent uh, caribou. Uh, I can tell you that there's nothing, very little left to eat up there. And, and you know, I, you could just, just see both the state and the price of the fruit and vegetable up there. You know, you just can't tell them to eat fruit and vegetables. Um, so we, uh, we, we've been in increasingly involved uh, in uh, nutrition research. Uh, we've involved almost half a billion in, in nutrition research uh, in, uh, over the past 10 years. And, and several of these initiatives have been on sodium reduction. And the, the latest one was a call, uh, joint call with uh, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Council uh, on sodium reduction in food supply to encourage food industry and academic researchers to work together to reduce sodium in the Canadian food supply. Not, not easy to get partners on this one. But some, you know, surprising results in some areas. Just, just an example, uh, the school edu salt study that found that salt intake was actually reduced in families where children educate their parents uh, on the effects of a salty diet. Uh, the salt intake was reduced by a quarter after the program i.e. by 1.9 grams per day in children and 2.9 grams per day in adults. Now, just to put things in perspective, if this were to be applied to China, we'd be talking about the prevention of approximately 400,000 stroke and, and, and heart attack events, uh, a half of which would be fatal. Um, physical activity, huge issue. Uh, obesity, huge issue. We've invested since our creation, again, uh, a, an important amount of money, quarter of a billion, into obesity research. Uh, and, and as you can see here again, we've, we've hit a bit of a wall in 2008 with the, you know, the, the, the flatlining of our budget, which have stopped this, what had been a pretty impressive increase in, in obesity research. And I don't have to convince this group of why this is a priority area for, for all of us. Uh, and, and finally, and that's going to be uh, bring us to the end of my talk, uh, global health and, and our uh, increased environment in global health, which actually has been, uh, has been sort of a recent thing for CIHR because of a misinterpretation of uh, the terms of our act, which is talking about the health of Canadians. And, and which the, uh, some members of the board early on interpreted as meaning that we had to focus research in Canada, not you know, realizing, first of all, that you know, uh, health systems and health care changes in other countries have a direct impact uh, on, on, on Canada, uh, that uh, many common issues and opportunities uh, exist for reciprocal learning for, for what's happening elsewhere in the world. And, and of course, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the global health investment means slowly, though, uh, building a cadre of it, researchers that, that will do that. Uh, and, and also associating that you know, our means, which, which remain limited, are synchronized with what we're doing elsewhere. And, and in this case, when it's a $36 million initiative that uh, we're doing with uh, Global Affairs Canada and the uh, international, uh, the, the IDRC, International Development Research Center in Canada, uh, which, which is really aligned with Canada's developmental policy uh, on maternal and child health to, to essentially achieve two things. A, provide evidence on which we can actually provide uh, developmental support and be evaluate uh, the effect uh, of our investments uh, in, in these African countries. So two sets of countries, one in Francophone Africa, that's an advantage, of course, that we have uh, many of us speaking French. Uh, we've had 
you know, a number of, of, of really special relationships with the Francophone community in Western Africa, and another one with uh, the English-speaking uh, side in, in Eastern Africa. So we've created first two health policy and research organizations, or actually had them compete, and we've se selected one in each case to oversee and be responsible for the integration and scale-up of the research that is produced by the 20 implementation teams that we're funding in the various countries that are part of the system. And, and I want to say a few words of what we've been doing in the context of the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease. Uh, a recent organization uh, created actually uh, to deal with uh, the realization that uh, although a, a hell of a lot of events had been put on infectious diseases, not to mean that they're no longer important, uh, in low and middle income countries, uh, chronic diseases were becoming an increasing problem in these countries and a problem that had to be tackled collectively. So it started with a little cadre of, of uh, health research organizations, the NIH, uh, the, you, know, you know, the usual suspects, the, the NIH in the U.S., uh, the MRC in the UK, CIHR in Canada, and the NHMRC in Australia, but with also the Academy of Medicine in China and uh, the MRC in India. And this has now grown to include the European Union, to include Mexico, to include Thailand, to include Argentina, to include Japan, to include South Africa, and I think I'm forgetting one, uh, sorry for that country. Uh, but the, 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 uh, the flags are there. Uh, and, and the idea is, <laughs> Is, is really, uh, you know, how, how do you make a difference? Uh, the first thing that uh, the countries around the table said and the agency around the table said, oh, we don't want to pull our, 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 our money because then, you know, we lose control. That, yeah, great. Uh, so uh, how do you, uh, in addition to that, run an organization like this? Well, as it turns out, uh, we decided to uh, focus on uh, implementation science develop implementation science and, you know, admittedly we cannot pull money but could we have the same call launched simultaneously in the various countries. Each country investing, you know, in the money that they could invest and, you know, small number of countries at the beginning actually, first call on hypertension, 23 million US dollars, not great. Second call, diabetes 2040, 32 million dollars. We just launched a call on chronic lung diseases. Actually, it's being launched as we speak, and it's already, uh, it, it's, it's, it's already been launched a, a couple of months ago in, in the EU. Uh, and, the, uh, and there we have over 50 million dollars. So it's, it's growing steadily, and, and we're hopeful that this is just the beginning. Uh, what's really interesting is that, of course, all the teams then we bring together, the successful teams, uh, to discuss uh, their results, share good practices. And that has led to actually an improvement in the development of the way to do implementation science, standardization of results, sharing of good practices. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, through this organization, we will be able, if we are able to then fund additional funders to allow us to work directly with the ministries of health in the countries where they is, as we discussed earlier on, you know, a, a, a relatively uh, stable governance system to, to uh, ensure a scale-up of the interventions, which is the ultimate motive of the, of the organization. So we've been involved, and I'll stop here, in a number of other organizations through the Arctic Council, where we've actually developed, when Canada was chair, an uh, initiative on um, suicide prevention be very happy to see that now the, the U.S. have taken the chairmanship and kept uh, that, uh, that initiative and, and brought it at number level, which is great. And another organization that I want to mention, which is very important in the global health field, which is Grand Challenges Canada, uh, which is more focused on developing innovation and uh, ensuring that uh, there is support for bringing innovations in low and middle income countries to bring them up to market. Uh, so uh, we are involved in, in, in the extent that we're on the board and also uh, we are responsible for all the peer review process uh, of Grand Challenges Canada to uh, ensure uh, the quality of the science. And I'll end with Ebola because I'm very proud of the, of the role we played in the Ebola fight. We may be small, but we develop uh, the successful vaccine. Uh, we carried out uh, the first phase one trial that showed that the vaccine uh, was actually, uh, well, 
it was actually safe. Uh, and, uh, and finally, we were part of, together with Norway, Médecins Sans Frontières, and the WHO, uh, the Ring, the, the, the Ring uh, clinical trial uh, in, uh, in, in Guinea that actually is the only trial that led to a publication in The Lancet, which you may have seen, and uh, which uh, actually uh, shows a, an impressive efficacy of this vaccine. Uh, the vaccine has since been uh, purchased and licensed to Merck. Uh, Merck is producing it, and uh, we are now in discussion with Merck for you know, the development of, of type uh, two and three trial that will, you know, which, which will be the regular, the, 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 um, the ring trial was, was really uh, half research, half humanitarian, I would say. We need now for regulatory approval to carry out a, a, a classical randomized trial. And uh, this is going to happen soon. And I will stop here and thank you for your attention. So we have time for a couple of questions. Let me open up the floor. Bill, there's a mic coming right now. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, in the United States, we have um, members of Congress, other politicians who are social conservatives, who have in the past raised objections to uh, certain avenues of research, especially for health problems that are rooted in the behavioral choices that people make. And in some cases, it's resulted in our funding agencies at the federal level being pressured to diminish areas of work or otherwise make adjustments to appease uh, those politicians. I was wondering to what extent that's been your experience in Canada, and if so, how you as an agency head deal with that. So uh, we, we, we have been, I, I must say, uh, the is of Health that I've worked under, uh, and under two different governments, uh, I've respected CIHR's independence, we're, we're, even though at times they were a little annoyed with but, uh, you know, I, I can give you an example. Uh, the Salome trial, uh, which is, I don't know whether you're aware, it's a huge trial in, uh, in, in BC and in, in Vancouver, uh, part of the INSIGHT uh, project uh, to look at uh, actually at, at administering opiates to, uh, to heroin addicts, actually, you know, upkeeping these, uh, these addicts with heroin. Uh, we've been funding this trial. Uh, this trial was uh, competitively uh, funded. It was a huge investment on our part. Uh, the government at the time, uh, ideologically, th that was not their thing. And uh, it was very clear. And, uh, but they did not attempt to, uh, to push for us to, uh, you know, not fund them. Uh, another example is, um, uh, is the, and, and you've probably not seen that, but at, at one point uh, an Italian called Zamboni claimed that he could actually uh, cure MS by uh, an intervention uh, involving the opening of the jugular veins, which frankly didn't have the equipoise uh, for us to fund a clinical trial. Uh, the government was under extraordinary pressure from its base uh, and from a number of members of parliament with questions in the house and the big, you know, and, and demonstrations on the hill and the whole thing to fund the trial. Uh, I, uh, and the Minister of Health, of course, asked us to fund the trial. And I said uh, that uh, we could not do that, uh, that we didn't have equipoise, but uh, that I, what I could do, because you also try to find compromise, right? You don't say, no, it's not your thing, you know, you, you try. Uh, so I said, look, I, I can have, you know, a blue ribbon panel of uh, the best in the country, neurologists, scientists, uh, and, uh, you know, trialists, and, and, and follow the literature on the subject and, and advise me. Uh, and if eventually uh, we get equipoise, then, then we will uh, be happy to fund a trial. Uh, and, uh, and, they, uh, and they, you know, the minister went in the house and defended that position. And, uh, and the press was ferocious with her, frankly. And she defended it. Uh, and so I, I think these are two examples that show that I've been lucky to, to have uh, ministers respecting our independence. 
Another question. Hi, thank you. I noticed most of your uh, discussion about health inequities involve the Aboriginal populations. Um, what about um, other immigrant groups or refugee groups? I wasn't sure where in your org chart that would fall into play. This is an interesting question. First of all, I mean, the, the, in, to tell you the truth, the, the investments in health inequity issues by the Institute have been much broader. I didn't illustrate everything. I mainly illustrated large uh, signatory initiatives that are CHR wide in that field. But they have invested way more, and we've invested more on uh, equity issues in Aboriginal people, but they have also invested way more on, on, on equity issues across the board in Canada. So uh, th that I think you know, I didn't mention, but, but is, is, is really important to... Uh... So please join me in thanking uh, Professor Bode for this talk.